people, if you haven't filled out a survey for what topics you'd like to see in 2024, please do. Uh, all you have to do is pick your top four choices. Um, so the big deal of what we want to do is to make room for more socializing than we could do just over Zoom. <laughs> So we'll try alternating education and so what we're calling social meetings. Um, so February's meeting will be social. We'll try breaking into heart groups uh, by our condition, like is uh, what um, a, a National, Mended Hearts National suggested. And that way you can compare notes on doctors, medications, procedures, abilities to answer questions, and the caregivers I'm especially interested in, how to prepare for home care. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have someone tell you what is expected about something before it happened? And how to ask good questions in the doctor's office. So um, let me tell you about our speaker. Anthony Poggio, DPM, is a practicing podiatrist in Alameda, California, with 40 years of experience. He graduated with honors from the California College of Podiatric Medicine in 1984. He then completed his in internship in general medicine and podiatry, along with his residency in podiatric surgery at the Pacific Coast Hospital in San Francisco. Dr. Anthony Poggio affiliates with many hospitals, including Alameda Hospital, Highland Hospital, and cooperates with many other doctors and specialists in the medical group, Bay Area Foot Care. He also works at the Alameda Wound Care Center, where he treats patients who have difficult leg wounds. Poggio is a member of the American Podiatric Medical Association and the California Podiatric Medical Association. He is board certified by the American Board of Podiatric Orthopedics and Primary Podiatric Medicine and the American Board of Podiatric Surgery. He is a physician reviewer for Physicians Review Network, Inc., an independent medical review organization. His office accepts new patients, mm -hmm. and he's left some cards on the table. And he speaks Cantonese and Italian. Well, thank you for having me this morning. Um, I don't speak Cantonese. That was my associate. But I uh, <laughs> do do a little bit of Spanish and definitely Italian. Uh, so uh, today I wanted to talk about hearts. Uh, I myself have had some heart procedures, so uh, definitely uh, can relate to all this. So let's uh, jump in here. If you have questions, you can. Uh, we can do questions at the end. If there's something that really is an issue that you're not understanding, you can always uh, use the chat button and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So the first thing you have to realize is that the heart is a muscle. And just like anything else, if you don't use it, you lose it. So um, muscle has to be strong. If you want to pump iron, so to speak, uh, build up stronger arms. You got to use them. You got to put weight through it. You got to stress it. And then you can build up heart, uh, arm muscles. And the same thing with the heart. Uh, it is a muscle. And so you have to kind of stress it to put strength through it and to have it respond. Now, obviously the doctors can help with medications and what have you, uh, but you need to work on it yourself. That's the important part. They can only do so much. There's only so many stents or uh, interventions and things they can do and so we're going to talk about these options uh, today uh, as to how you can, how they sort of interrelate and how you can strengthen your heart. So the first sign, again, no, nothing of this is 100%, okay? So everything varies with people. Uh, some signs that there may be a heart problem is that you develop pains in your legs. Um, although this can be bad veins, not so much a heart problem. You could have back problems like sciatica that can cause pain. Um, pain in your legs, but if you've had your back checked out and you've had this checked out and that checked out and nothing is working, <laughs> you start going back to maybe arteries and heart. A lot of people are, you're told, elevate your legs because you have swelling. That's a common problem with a lot of uh, heart problems. Uh, as well as we age, the veins tend not to be so strong anymore. 
And so elevate your legs. Well, when you do that, your legs start to hurt. Uh, that can be a back problem. It could also be a circulation problem. Uh, what happens when you elevate your legs? Now your legs are fighting gravity. And so you can, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too, uh, that that can be a sign of poor circulation to your legs, which may be a leg problem, could be a heart problem. Um, the other one that usually I'll ask is how far can you walk? Can you do what you used to do? And if you can't walk because you have a bad hip or you fractured something, that's pretty obvious. But if everything else is fine and you just find your stamina down, that can be a problem with your heart. Um, you're short of breath. You used to be able to go downstairs and bring your laundry. Uh, now you can't. So that can be a heart problem. Um, and then discoloration of the legs. Again, that's kind of vague. But if you see your legs a little bit on the bluer side, um, that can be an issue. Keep in mind that you also get bluish legs when your feet are cold. They just they get bluish when you're like your fingers and things get cold. Yeah. The biggest thing you can do is don't smoke. Um, if there's one thing you take away from this lecture, and if you are a smoker or if you know people who smoke, you got to quit that. Uh, nicotine constricts the vessels, and that affects in my world, the legs and the feet, but obviously it'll negatively impact your heart and your lungs. So circulation problems. Um, you may get pain in your legs. Um, now you can have pain in your legs because you have neuropathy too. So again, nothing is 100%, but these are things we think about. Uh, intermittent claudication is a problem with circulation. That's a vein problem. Excuse me, That's a, a that can be vein and artery. And what happens with that is you have a story where you can walk two, three blocks, and then you have to stop. Your legs feel like there's a hundred pounds strapped to them. You don't have to do anything. You just sort of sit there or stand there, you know, holding on to a, a, a lamp post or a signal light or something. And you rest for a few seconds, minute, and then you can walk another three blocks. And then the same thing happens. Your legs feel like a lead weight. You have to stand there. You don't have to sit. You just have to stand there. And then you wait a few seconds and then you walk another three blocks. Now, first you used to walk three blocks. Now that happens at two blocks. Now that happens at one block. That's called intermittent claudication. So what happens there is that you have blood in your muscle uh, and then the muscle uses up the blood because that's what it needs to function. Uh, and then it runs out of uh, fuel. It runs out of blood. And then you start to get that heaviness, that cramping. And then when you sit there, you basically reload and allows you to walk another two blocks, three blocks till you run out of fuel. Then you reload and then you walk another two or three blocks. So these are things you want to check for because if it's partially artery, partially vein, you don't want to throw any blood clots. Uh, so you want to check this out. Everybody has a pulse. You can feel a pulse on your wrist. You can also feel a pulse on, there's two places to show a pulse. I can show you later. You should feel a pulse. And if you don't feel a pulse, that's not horrible necessarily, but you want to feel a pulse. If your leg's a little swollen, you might not be able to feel a pulse. If your feet are cool, that's not a horrible thing, but you want to check it, especially if your feet get cooler. Um, it's a warm room, but you're complaining of just ice cold feet. Um, loss of hair. Again, the body's very good about rationing where it wants to send nutrients. And sometimes you'll see a foot without much hair, and that may mean that there's bad circulation. So if you don't have much hair, don't panic. This is just one thing that we kind of look at. And the skin will get very, very thin and almost like it's being stretched. And that's a, another sign of not great circulation to your feet. If you don't have good circulation to your feet, you may not have good circulation to your heart. When we take an x-ray of your feet, sometimes you'll see um, calcification of the arteries. And when I see that, I'll always call the family doc and say, hey, be aware of this. If I see it in the feet, there may be some calcification in the heart. You may not have any heart problems, but you may be getting calcification until that magic day that you run into problems. May I ask a question? Sure. Does loss of hair really uh, mean something is, uh, circulation is impaired? It can be because the body's gonna ration where it wants to send blood and nutrients. 
And so you will see that. Now, again, a lot of it is some people are hairier than others. So by itself, that's not a problem. But if you start to see cool feet, loss of hair, shiny skin, no pulse, that just sort of creates a picture that wow. something may not be right. Wow. Thank you. So no, none of these are by itself. You're going to go run to the doc because you feel this or see this. Um, a lot of things cause shiny skin. But when you put five or six things together, then you can say, okay, there may be a problem. So problems with veins. If you see a lot of swelling in your legs, <clears throat> again, that can be from a lot of different things. But remember, your blood goes into your heart and it has to go out of your heart. And it's sort of like the Bay Bridge at five o'clock. You got too many cars going in and not enough cars going out. And so what happens? It backs up. And so if you're not pumping out what comes in, you back up. And so if your heart's not pumping hard enough, then you lose the fight and you start to back up. So that's one issue that we that we can see. Again, there are other issues for, for swollen legs, um, but that's one of the issues. The other thing you got to remember is you have a, a pump that's, you know, right up in your heart, right? And it pumps the blood out. But what gets the blood to pump back up from your, there's no pump in your foot. So all the blood has to go up and has to fight gravity. And that's one of the problems that we have is, is gravity. When you elevate your legs at night, you lose gravity. And so if there's not much blood going into your legs, because there's a lot of a calcification and bad circulation, when you elevate them, not only do you have to fight circulation, but you have to fight gravity. And so if you find that you, you hurt when you elevate your legs and you feel better when you dangle your legs, <clears throat> that can be arterial. So if you add that with cold feet, pale skin color, thin skin, things like that, that we just talked about, um, that can be an arterial problem. It's things you should mention to your doctor. Uh, I do a lot, I see wounds. So if you say, well, you know, I scratched myself on a rose bush and it's been three weeks and it hasn't healed a lick, that might be an arterial problem. You're just get, not getting enough blood flow there to heal a wound. You might have enough to sort of keep things together, but not enough to heal a wound. Vein problems are better when you elevate them because you get the blood out of your legs. Uh, a lot of people have to get up a lot at night to go to the bathroom. That can be from a lot of other reasons. But when you're sitting like I'm doing and probably all of you are doing, and your legs swell up a lot, imagine how much liquid is in your legs. Now, when you lay down flat at night or you elevate your legs, all that fluid rushes north up into your kidneys, and then they got to do something with it. And so they start to process it, and then you have to go to the bathroom. So try to elevate your legs as much as you can, um, and that can help. Wounds that don't heal can also be from veins, not just from circulation. So Circulation needs to be evaluated in conjunction with your heart. So what do you do for arteries? You keep walking. The body's amazing. It can create its own little bypasses um, without having a doctor do it. And the best way to do that is to walk. Walk as much as you can. Yes, you have a bad hip, so maybe you can't walk very far. But if you can, instead of walking um, you know, 30 minutes, walk two times, 15 minutes. So that, just, that doesn't put so much strain on your, on your hip, for example. But the more you walk, the more you force it, the more circulation you'll get into your leg and you'll build up your heart. From the vein side, you wanna watch your salt because salt makes you retain water. Uh, you wanna elevate. Uh, I'll show you a picture of some compression garments. And if you're on a water pill, make sure you take it. Now, compression garments, a lot of people hate these things because you can't get them on. The really super tight stockings, your fight, you, you just, you can't do it. Um, you don't have the arm strength. You can't bend because of your back, because of your hip. Um, this one guy has these pumps, which we don't use all that often, but I just showed them. Uh, but if you can't put support stockings on, there are these wraps that you see on the left. They're called juxtalites. And they just wrap around like Velcro. Uh, and that can be a problem. Some people use compression stockings, but they get the real thin ones that, almost like a pair of pantyhose. They don't really give you compression and you need to be fitted for these. So you want to see a doctor or go to a place um, that like a medical supply place where they will actually measure you. Uh, it, you don't get a, um, it's not based upon the fact that you have a nine and a half foot 
and you know your next door neighbor has a size 12 it's based upon how big your calf is so measuring is key with these uh, nerves that can also sometimes confuse people as far as my legs hurt you know and people will oftentimes say I, I need to move around and then i get the circulation back and then i feel better that's probably not circulation because circulation is 24 7 but your back can be a problem um, you wake up, your back is stiff and you get burning in your legs. And then when you move around, you're basically doing physical therapy and that takes the pressure off your back or a pinched nerve. And then you feel better. If it's one-sided, that's usually a back issue. If it's both sides, it's, it can be something else. Neuropathy, diabetics get this a lot. Uh, the, the two main causes of neuropathy is alcohol and diabetes Everything else we don't know. It's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Neuropathy, neuropathy is present all the time. If you say, well, I wake up in the morning and I'm fine by the afternoon, I'm, I'm not, that's not neuropathy. You wake up with it, you eat with it, you go to bed with it. Um, if it varies, it's something else. Uh, you can, these are some tests that we do in the office um, that we can obviously do. Um, so like I said, the, the case for back is usually unclear anywhere between the toes and the low back. And you can, you can have a problem. There are plenty of pinched nerves in the feet that can cause foot pain. It doesn't mean you have neuropathy. If any of you are diabetic or no diabetics, the problem is the minute you say I'm diabetic, everybody quits thinking. Uh, every time you get a nerve an itch and this and that it's neuropathy. Well, you know, you have diabetes. Uh, no, it could be because you have an itch. Uh, it could be because you have a pinched nerve in your foot. Uh, and that should be investigated beyond just, hey, I'm sorry, you're diabetic and I don't want to talk about it. May I ask another question? Sure. I, when I had intermittent pains in my legs, whether I was standing on cement in the uh, TV studio on camera where I can't say a word or I'm at night when I was lying in bed and suddenly my... Uh, legs erupted in pain. It was usually only one at a time. Um, but I went to a neurologist who said, this is statin-induced myopathy. And when I stopped the statins and went to something else, they it stopped. Was it a, a pinched nerve or what, what, was, what was the statin doing? Well, the statins commonly do that. And so if you if you started taking a pill, any pill, and then you started getting some sort of symptom, um, it could very well be that pill. And then the treatment, obviously, is you stop the pill. And if the pain goes away, it's some side of it's like a side effect of that. Um, usually, again, the neurologist probably knows more about this than I do. Usually the the statin is is like all the time. I mean, it's in your system. Night pain is can be kind of weird because two things in my world cause that. One is um, all day long you're vertical and then you go to bed and you're like this and that changes the way your back lines up. And so night pain can be just, so what I tell people is, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon, go lie down for 20 minutes. If the back pain comes back, that's your back because you go from vertical to horizontal. Um, at night, it's also what I call payback pain. It's not what you do that moment in bed. It's what you've been doing all day. You walk the dog, you went shopping, you swept the, the yard, you did this, you did that. And then you're sore. And then when you're sitting there at night and you have nothing to think about besides your back, you tend to feel more of your back. During the day, you're distracted. You got shopping to do. You got leaves to rake. Um, and then so at nighttime, it can be payback pain. And so if today I did a lot and my back hurts and tomorrow I don't do so much and my back doesn't hurt, that's that's what I call the payback pain. But obviously these are things that you want to check out because it's not one size fits all. Right. I, I was given um, uh, pain pills uh, by one doctor and I called my uh, cardiologist and just happened to mention that. And he said, well, that's really not my area. Right. So um, I, I had no idea that uh, it was a side effect of statins. So 
because uh, I found it. I found it on WebEx or Web WebMD. Well, <laughs> it was a side effect. Well, the key is you know your body better than anybody. And if you say this doesn't feel right, well, if I don't know, if I don't understand, or if I can't figure it out, you go find somebody else who maybe looks at it from a different angle, a different specialty, a different something. If you don't feel right, uh, I can't feel that. I don't know what that burning feels, what that twinge in your stomach feels like. I can't feel that. So you have to explain it to me. And if I, if it's just not my area because it's neurologic, it's cardiac, it's this, it's that. Uh, like I said, you know your body the best and you have to tell me how that works. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. At night when I'm asleep, I wake up periodically because I'm on Lasix. And I have to get out of bed and stand up going to the uh, bathroom and then get back into bed and I'm okay for a while. But otherwise, my legs and back hurt. One thing you can try to do is to take the Lasix in the morning. I uh, do. I take it twice a day. Okay. Well, then you can talk to your, again, maybe um, it's, you don't want to take too much Lasix because then you can get dehydrated. So you got to figure out if there's a way you can sort of change the regimen a little bit so you don't have to get up. Because yes, Lasix will make you get up, whether it's in the morning or at night, it'll make you get up a whole bunch of times. If you have to get up because your back hurts and you got to jiggle around a little bit, that's probably more of a back or an arthritic or something of that sort. I do have arthritis. Right. And I so, have back issues. So you got to get that part checked out. Uh, uh, different mattress. Um, there are some other medications you can try that might help you. If it's back pain, uh, there's medicines like gabapentin that can take some of the sting out of the nerve. It also kind of relaxes you a little bit that helps you sleep. It's not a sleeping pill. It's not a narcotic, but um, that's something you can try to talk to whoever's looking at your back to see if there are other options that might help you sleep. Now, what did you call that? Gabapentin, G-A-B-A-P-E-N-T-I-N. It also goes by Neurontin. And there's a whole bunch of pills in that family. If you've tried that and it didn't work, or if it makes you too loopy, there are other options you can try. Something to try again. Does it work? I don't know. But you try this, you try that until hopefully you, you know, you stumble across something that works. You try to stay away from the narcotics for obvious reasons. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, and that's a non-narcotic option. Thank you. Um, so musculoskeletal things obviously can cause pain and keep you uh, awake. This is not circulation. Um, I have arthritis. I need to move my leg around a little bit. Uh, then my circulation's better. No, that's probably arthritis or a tendonitis or something like that. Uh, so you can be aware of these. There's Charcot, which is the third one down. That's a condition that's pretty unique to diabetics um, where the foot can just collapse. Um, one minute you're fine. And the next minute you're, you have a pancake at the end of your ankle. Um, and that's specifically a diabetic thing. It sometimes doesn't hurt, but, uh, because of neuropathy, but if you see rapid changes in anything, whether it's your foot, your arms, your neck, your back, that's something to bring up. Um, this is kind of like a hammer toe, which is basically a crooked toe. Having a hammer toe is not against the law. If you have this, you have this. It's a foot type that lends itself to this. These are some examples of some hammer toes. Um, another kind of, you can see people with bunions can develop hammer toes. This is a foot type that unfortunately you got from mom and dad. Uh, you could make it better, you could make it worse, depending on whether you're a more sedentary person, more active, uh, I hate to sound sexist, but you know, high heel shoes, um, all these things can aggravate things, and these can cause pain in your feet. Um, Could you use your cursor and show us what where the bunions are? So bunions are these guys right here, uh -huh. uh, and you can see the toes kind of heading south. So um, these are again these are hammer toes right here, uh, where they just buckle and curl and go every which a ways. Sometimes when you have a bunion, the second toe will kind of cross over, kind of almost like you're keeping your fingers crossed. Um, and sometimes you get a, a corn on the top, like right here. You, you can, you, you can't, these don't necessarily hurt. They just may look weird. They sometimes make it hard to wear shoes. 
um, but they don't uh, necessarily have to hurt. Uh, we fix them when they hurt. Um, so what you don't want these to hurt is limit your ability to walk. Because again, you got to keep walking. A, a question. So on the outside of both my feet, right below the little toe, um, over time, I, I don't know if they're calluses or corns or whatever, they they build up, they start to extrude outward a little bit. They're At some point, they become very painful. And sometimes I've seen this tiny little ball of, of, of mass that I think is causing the pain. Do you know what that is and, and if there's any kind of um, remedy for that? Okay, so this is your basic bunion. Right. Over here, if you just yes. put... It's called a bunionette just because it's a cute little name for it. It's the, oh. it's the same basic process. This guy sticks out this way. That guy sticks out that way. So right. the rules are basically the same. This thing sticks. Let's assume this is your baby toe side right here. Yeah. This thing sticks out and rubs on your shoes. So you develop yeah. a bursitis, which is the swelling that you're seeing. Uh, you might get a callus. Um, we're going to do some things about shoes, but sometimes people walk a little bit what we call inverted like this. And so you hit on this side rather than kind of level. And that can create uh, too much pressure. Calluses are caused because something rubs on something. Um, and in this case, it's you against the ground or the bone against the ground and the skin is caught between a rock and a hard place. So the way to fix that is, I mean, you know, you can do the usual, put some ice on it, that type of stuff. Uh, we try to fix the shoes to balance you out. If the thing is just really inflamed, just like this guy, we can try a limited, limited, limited number of injections. It's not something you want to get shot in every week, um, but we can try it once in a while. Shoe gear is a problem, and we'll talk about shoe gear a little bit later. Because Okay, great. There is no magic shoe out there, and unfortunately, you got to figure it out, and I'll show you how to do that. Great. Thank you. Props. Oh. Shoe. Okay. So... Everybody knows about length. Everybody knows about width. But what a lot of people don't know is this direction. This is depth. All right. So remember, you got a toe that's buckled like this. It needs depth. It could be a size 14 shoe, quadruple extra wide. It's not going to help the fact that your toe is buckled. So you need to look at, if you have things like hammer toes, you need to look at depth. If you have the bunion or the bunionette, you have to look at uh, obviously in this direction over here uh and uh width or length is obviously length we can put pads in the shoes to treat things sometimes uh we can trim the callus if there's a callus there there's surgeries we can do but shoe is going to be the biggest the biggest thing the best advice shoe wise that i can give you is don't buy your shoes in the morning um go do what you do if it's work go to work if you walk the dog walk the dog let your foot get beat up, let it get stomped on, let it do whatever it does, let it swell up to three times its size, I don't care. And then you go to the shoe store at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, because at eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, you're the first person in line, everything fits. And then by three o'clock, you're wondering why you, you were stupid enough to buy that shoe. And so um, go later in the day, after you've done what you do, you'll get a better sense. So there is no magic shoe. The best shoe I ever bought cost me 21 bucks at Costco. Um, it just fit me. Whoever designed this shoe had me in mind. Uh, and you don't have to spend a thousand dollars. I know a lot. Well, I spent the most, the most expensive shoe was out there. This is the one I bought. It could be a piece of junk as far as your foot is concerned. So the key is try on certain shoes. I know nowadays we talked about COVID and all that. It's easy to go online, but you know, somebody's eight and a half is not your eight and a half. Um, Shoes are actually stitched. Somebody stitches the shoe together. And if you, like anything, if you were to draw a line, sometimes you're a little bit to the left, sometimes you're a little bit to the right. And that can mean that that shoe is an eight and a quarter, not an eight and a half. And so sometimes even trying on the same size of the same shoe might give you a different uh, fit. A lot of times people say, well, I've worn the Nike XYZ model when I go walking for three years. I went and bought a new one. The thing hurts like hell. Uh, well, what happens is the shoe people change what they call the last. The last is the mold that they make the shoe from. And just like car manufacturers, they change the model every year just to make it look a little fancier or whatever. 
And if they change the last, it may not fit you. It, it's just a little bit too narrow. It's a little bit, it, you know, this, for example, if you look at the bottom, some shoes are more straighter. Some shoes have a bit of a veer to them. And if they change the last, what used to fit may not fit you. And so that's why I always recommend trying on shoes. Although sometimes for various reasons, it's much, much easier to buy them online if you know, you know, kind of what you need. Um, and then we're, I guess we're, we'll go over some shoes later to show you what, uh, what I call forensic podiatry. Um, so skin problems that we see that can impact the foot, obviously athletes foot rashes and things like that. If you see this type of stuff, you want to uh, be aware of it. Uh, if you belong to a gym, health club, swimming pool, anything like that, try not to go barefoot. The reason is you can pick things up. Psoriasis is a medical problem. You're not going to pick that up. But athlete's foot, warts, things like that, you can pick up. So when you go to public places, including visiting, you know, your son's house in Chicago for Christmas, you know, if they have fungus, you can pick it up and then you got to deal with that. Um, and again, if your circulation is not great, that can be a problem. Um, so these are things that you can kind of do. The last thing you want to do is have a bad foot that's from itching, from a painful wart, from a painful callus. <laughs> So that you do what? I don't want to walk. My foot hurts. Well, there goes your heart. So you got to Even the simple things can come back to bite you in the butt. Um, so some other things, uh, ingrown nails. Again, these are kind of simple things that we see. Here's um, some ingrown nails. Sometimes they get very thick, like on this one right here. This is a fungus that's in the nail. Again, these aren't necessarily horrible things, but if they affect your walking, again, the key is to keep you walking. So these are things that we can try to treat. They're not easy to treat, but we can try to treat them and see if we can make you uh, more comfortable. Um, there are some treatments for fungal nails and none of them are great. A lot of them are sort of like wives tail type of stuff, which don't really work. Um, but we can uh, we can definitely go over some of that stuff. Uh, so again, this is sometimes you can get calluses between the toes. Uh, some people complain of, I have dry skin. Uh, it can be dry skin because you have dry skin. It could be fungus, uh, classic fungal pattern, and it doesn't have to itch like they say on TV. It's called a moccasin. If you look at how a moccasin would fit your foot, if the rash is in the form of that moccasin or the shape of that moccasin, it's probably fungal. If you put a lot of creams on here, I got dry skin. So let's put a lot of cream on here. Cream makes it worse. So if it's so you should get it checked out because if if it's a fungus, you need an antifungal medication. If you have fungus between the toes, you don't want to put a lot of goop in there. You want to keep that as dry as you can, a little bitty medicine, and then uh, keep it really dry because fungus needs moisture. And you can get fungus in a lot of places on your body, and it's usually where skin touches skin. So you want to keep whoops, you want to keep that area nice and dry. Uh, ingrown nails. Again, this usually you can get like a nasty little infection there that can keep you from walking. And if you get that, that's a sim relatively simple fix uh, that we can help you to keep you walking. Next one's my favorite slide. Who doesn't love this? I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> shoes like that put my kids through college. I, I don't see why everybody doesn't wear those shoes, the, particularly the red ones. They're really hot. Uh, so this is my recommendation for shoe gear. <laughs> Are we still sending your kids through college? <laughs> Do they it's, the it's the annuity plan now. Oh, okay. So, um, and I, and again, shoes, it, it, it doesn't have to be a thousand dollars. Just make sure, you know, if you have bumps and things and, or if you have toes that are, that are rubbed, make sure you get like a softer leather. The shoe I just showed you is kind of a mesh. Um, if you work in construction, yeah, you have to wear steel toed boot, uh, but take the time to fit. And, and again, some, uh, just get the best shoe you can and your foot's going to tell you which is the best shoe. Um, the problem with, with socks is you don't want to end up with that little ring around the, just below your knee where you got that little, cause that's almost like a little tourniquet. And if you're seeing that, that can, it's almost like when you take a blood test, they put that tourniquet around your arm. They make your, your everything swell up so they can pop the vein and get the blood out. Knee highs can do that. 
And if you're getting, if you see that big gouge in your knee anywhere on your leg, that shoe is too tight. Or excuse me, that sock is too tight. Uh, and so the thing about compression stockings is that elastic is the whole way up, not just that little bitty ring uh, around the top. So if you're seeing that that gouge in your leg, that sock is not a good sock for you. Um, so the problem with this shoe is, again, the depth. Um, and that's what's going to get you. Uh, this is an insole. We'll go over some insoles here in a sec, just to show you what I do with an, what I check for in an insole. If your feet need more support, um, this is what you want. A foot that's a flat foot needs more support. A foot that's higher arched needs more cushion. And so if you, if you get too much cushion, um, how many guys out there, uh, I don't know if I can see a show of hands or whatever, uh, Skechers. Okay, so I hate those shoes. Um, they're, they're great shoes for around the house. You want like a house shoe? They're great. Uh, they're soft. They're cushy. They're everything you want in a, in a shoe. But when you're walking, it's too soft. And if you guys remember, uh, walk on the beach, is it easy to walk in the sand? It's almost impossible to walk in the sand. Once you get to the wet part, then you do okay. But in the soft stuff, you don't make any kind of headway. And so that's kind of what insoles and cushions and pads sometimes will do. They can sort of make it worse. Uh, these are, some, I just threw these out there. These are some braces. Sometimes as we get a little older and we have arthritis and we have other problems, um, um, we need bracing sometimes. Uh, and they're out of braces. I know these look all scary, but they can actually keep you walking. The key is to walk because if you're, you know, if you're weak on one side, that's a problem. But you know, walk. Uh, my next story, I'll tell you this funny story. There was an elderly lady that lived in a board and care around my block. And she was 87, I think. And she had a walker. And she would walk a mile twice a day. It took her, you know, half an hour to get from one end of my house to the other end of the house. Um, she would stop and chit chat with all the neighbors. Everybody knew her. Um and my next two houses down, my next door neighbor had knee surgery and he was 48 at the time. And his goal in life was to beat Blanche because when he first started walking, he couldn't beat Blanche. But eventually, as he got his knee stronger, he was able to beat Blanche. And so you want to be like Blanche. Um, I'd like to talk about diabetes just because it's really common. I don't know how many of you out there have diabetes or no people who have diabetes, but it's a big problem. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, with diet. A lot of it has to do with that diet plus obesity. Um, it's the most common cause of amputations in America. Um, and once you have an amputation, that's not a good place to be. Impacts your walking, et cetera, et cetera. 15% um, 50 50 of diabetics will develop an ulcer. Neuropathic means you can't feel the ground, which means you don't know there's a problem, which means you keep walking on it, which means you develop a problem. Of those, 20% will lose a limb. And of those, 50% will lose the other side. So that obviously is not a good place to be. If you look at this slide, don't get too crazy about it. But if you look at, this is neuropathic ulcers. This is how many are done right here in the green. If you look at lymphoma, breast cancer, prostate cancer, these three together don't even equal that. So death from lymphoma, breast cancer, and prostate cancer are less than deaths due to complications of ulcers. So if you have people in your family or yourself that ah, I'm okay, I just eat this chocolate cake, um, try to hit them over the head with the two by four, tell them I said so. Um, because you can do tremendous amounts of impact to help these people. Uh, they sometimes are very, very stubborn, but this slide doesn't lie. Um, there's a lot of mortality associated with diabetes and ulcers. Um, ulcer prevention with, uh, again, this is not just in feet. The other common place to get pressure ulcers, especially for people that are not very mobile, um, is on the small of their back. Those are horrible. Um, and on the heels, on the back of your heel where your Achilles tendon attaches, uh, somebody will go to a hospital, they'll break a hip, and they end up with a heel ulcer 
because they don't move or they use their heels to kind of dig in and fidget. That is a horrible place to be. Um, try to keep your feet off the ground, what we call floating. So you put like a pressure here. So the heel is, or your foot is off the ground. If you put pressure right here, you're not helping anything. So it's gotta be like up in the calf area. So you call what's floating the heels and, and save your loved one a whole lot of problems. Um, treatment for all this stuff, walk. Second treatment, don't do this. Uh, yeah, make, make sure you keep your diabetes in good control. Again, exercise, educate yourself, know what you're up against. It's, it, it's Diabetes is tough. It's a long, long, it's a lifelong fight. You miss a blood pressure pill, usually it's not a problem. You miss your diabetic insulin, it's a problem. Um, things to avoid for everybody. This is more important with, with diabetics. Avoid temperature extremes. You do not have to soak your feet in blistering hot water. You can soak your feet in warm water and get just whatever benefit you're trying to get out of it. You're not gonna get it by cranking up the heat. A lot of people say, I put my feet in as hot a water as I can stand. You can burn yourself. So it's lukewarm water. If you're diabetic and you can't feel, if you have neuropathy, use your hand to check the water. Because if you dip your big toe in there, you're not gonna feel the temperature. Don't wear constrictive things like those stockings we talked about. A lot of people have calluses, things like that. They like to use acid plasters, Dr. Scholl's corn plasters. If you read the itty bitty fine print, which is like one point font on somebody who can't see very well, it says, don't use this for more than six or eight hours. Don't use it if you're diabetic. But you know, you fell asleep, uh, you got a bad phone call, somebody's in the hospital, you forget. Next thing you know, that acid plaster is on there for hours. You can create a nice burn and acid burns are the worst. So try to avoid those if you can. Um, don't use, um, you know, use a pumice stone. Don't use razors, things like that, sharp instruments. And again, avoid tobacco products like the plague. Uh, things not to do, don't go barefoot, especially if you know if you have bad circulation, you may not be able to heal that cut. Um, if you don't feel things, you won't be able to feel you stepped on a rock. Again, be careful with heating pads and hot water bottles because you don't know how hot hot is. Uh, try to avoid using corns using sharp things on corns and calluses. That's what there's doctors for that. Um, keep your feet dry. If you soak your feet, that's fine. If it makes you feel better, but don't stay damp. Um, wearing thong sandals are okay. Uh, just make sure they don't rub between your toes. Um, uh, don't smoke. There you go. So things to do, check your feet. You know your feet. You come in, you say, my foot looks red. I look at it. I think it's pink. Um, so what do we do? You tell me it's not the way it normally looks. I have to believe that. It may look okay to me right now, but it's not what you'd like. And so you need to tell me what these things look like. Check your feet. Yeah, I haven't really don't check my feet. I can't see. Uh, it's on the back of my heel. I can't really bend. Have a spouse, have a neighbor, have a uh, whoever. Check them periodically. How long has that sore been there? Ah, a couple of days, three days, four days. It's been there a month. And that changes the, the whole parameter of how to do things. Uh, we talked about uh, temperature. Um, Cut nails straight across. Try not to dig in the corners. That's where you get your mat, your basic ingrown nail. Uh, if that's a problem, there are things that we can do to help you. Uh, socks, again, a lot of people don't like to wear socks even at home, but they can keep your feet warm if you have a problem. Uh, check your shoes. I had a lady, uh, I, I should say, I, I put my hand inside her shoe and uh, I got jabbed and I pulled my hand out and I said, what the heck? And at the end of my fingers, a sewing needle. Uh, and the lady looked at me and said, oh, that's where it went. Um, so, you know, periodically you might want to check these things, uh, especially if you like to go hike. There's rocks, there's twigs, there's stickers, there's all sorts of stuff. Put your hand inside the shoe, feel around in there. It may have been a wonderful shoe for you, but it is a couple years old. Things start to wear out. The lining wears out, things like that. It's time to get a new shoe. Um, measure, you, you know, don't just buy a nine and a half just for the heck of it and go home. Uh, put your foot in it. It might not be the same nine and a half. Um, orthotics and shoes, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and if you see something, you know, I bought a new pair of shoes and I got this big red spot. 
um, we need to figure out why. So that's that, but... Um, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I don't know how this is gonna show up, but the normal, so, so when you look at wear path, okay, you look at a shoe and it looks horrible, but it's identical to the other side. That's not so horrible. Um, everybody's different. Some people are a little more knock kneed Some people are this, some people are that. That's just the way you were born. Um, so it's not illegal if this thing doesn't fly, but generally this is the baby toe side over here. You tend to wear out over here normally. Then you kind of wear up going this part and then it kind of goes this way because you push off your big toe. Your big toes, are, it's big for a reason. And that's because that's where your load goes through. Okay. So if you see pattern on the side uh, and then it kind of goes like this and then it kind of goes like that, that's what you're supposed to do. So don't let the wear kind of throw you, especially if it's identical. If you see the wear on this side on the right and on this side on the left, now you may have a problem. Um, so again, these are things that we use to, to pick up that there may or may not be an issue. Does everybody have a tennis shoe they've worn for a long time? Yeah. It has a removable insole. Oh, yes. Ooh. Let's spy on people. Well, good. Okay, so do you do I still hold this up here? Or are they yeah, seeing? There's they're still seeing. Can you still see all this? Okay. So again, so here we have, you know, the wear pattern over here is a little bit more towards the center than over to the side. But again, this is this is fine. You got wear up here, which is fine. But what I like to do is look at this. Um, okay. Because this don't lie. Okay, so. Okay, so if you look at this insole, what's the first thing you see? Is there's this dark area up here. So what does that mean? That's where you're putting a lot of pressure. Oh. Okay, so let's say you have a callus under your second toe, or actually not, you know, more like under here, right? And you were to see a big dark spot like that. Okay, could that's you, where that's where your callus is. Could you point to the dark spot so the people are there? Okay. So okay. that's where your that's where your callus is. So that means you're putting pressure there. So you have a couple of options. For example, let me put the, let me put the dark spot. So this is uh, that dark spot on this side. So this is where she's putting way too much pressure. For example, so what do you do? Well, you trim the callus, which makes her feel better. But the callus is going to come back because something rubs on something. Um, there are surgeries you can do, but sometimes on a patient who has a heart issue, surgery is not the best option. So if you see something like this, like this sort of darker area up here, I don't know if that comes across, and you see where the pressure points are, then on the bottom, you can just put a padding that kind of does something like this to take the pressure off that, to take the pressure off that area. So all the weight goes over here and not much goes right there. Is that a cure? No. Uh, does it make the patient feel better? Yes. Does, it, does that allow them to walk more? Yes. Does that make their heart stronger? Yes. So this simple little pad is worth a million dollars in my book. I have a question. Yes. Yeah, could, I'm not clear on what you said to do if your legs hurt at night when you wake up and you have to go, you want to go back to sleep. When I get out of bed, urinate and then get back in bed they're they're better but then they hurt again when i'm flat on my when i'm on my back i'm not my back when i'm on in bed All right so so two things to think about uh one is that again when you're lying in bed the way your spine comes together remember the spine's a bunch of little poker chips mm -hmm. and they come together uh and the way they come together may differ when you're lying flat on the in bed versus uh standing straight up so yeah, if, well, if i'm it, usually on my side okay well that's better uh but you but if you were to go take a nap at two o'clock in the afternoon 
and your back starts to hurt, then it may be just positional and there's something wrong with your back. So you get a back x-ray, you sort of see what's going on. The other option is you're also up. And if every time you get up, remember, now you have gravity. When you're laying in bed, there's no gravity. And so the blood doesn't flow, maybe. So a lot of people with bad circulation don't like to lay down or don't like to elevate their legs because they lose gravity. Now, yeah, well, not... I have heart failure, just for information. Okay. So that's why, again, it, it's it's not... Um, um, what I don't want you to take away that this is the answer to your problem. You just need to mention this to your doc because if you if your heart's not pumping as hard, you know, um, you it makes it harder when you're vertical than when you're horizontal. And so if every time you get, if it's at the end of the day, that could be fatigue. You just been on your, on you've been using your body all day long. And at night you just fatigue and then you get stiff. Um, a lot of us get up and kind of wiggle and jiggle their back for a while or move their shoulder because oh, I got stiff last night because you have a an arthritic shoulder. So you have to do like physical therapy to get it going. Uh, when you're moving, you're doing physical therapy. When you're not moving, you're not doing physical therapy. Uh, normal, lateral physical therapy. I didn't mean physical therapy like you go to a place. So you should mention it to your doctor that this is what happens so that they can make sure it's not a back problem, uh, make sure it's not a circulation problem, uh, and then see if that helps you in some way. You mentioned some um, uh, a medication. Uh, well, there's a medicine called Neurontin, and that's and that's not a circulation medicine. That's more for people who have nerve problems that keep them awake. They lay down and they get like I don't know a burning, a tingling, uh, something like that in their back, uh, and that can sort of help that. Um, if I mean, if gabapentin or something. I'm sorry. It was. Gabapentin? Yes, that's the medication. And there's a lot of medicines like that. That's just one um, option. Uh, some people don't like it and they'll take a different one. Uh, but you can see if that helps you, if that helps you sleep a little. Plus, again, it makes you a little bit drowsy. So you got to be careful. You don't want to fall and hurt yourself. Right. Uh, these are things that you want to mention to your family doc or have you seen by an orthopedic doc who can evaluate your back just to make sure there's not a back problem that might be helpful. Or might oh, be I have arthritis. I know that. Well, yeah. So, I mean, you can go the whole gamut from medicines like Neurontin, maybe get you some physical therapy. Uh, you could do epidurals. You know, now you're starting to talk about more invasive types of things. Uh, but I would make sure you mention that to your doctor and don't let them blow it off. I have one question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned something earlier that I didn't catch. There was something that you said could indicate calcification in the heart, didn't you? Yeah. So sometimes I'll take a foot x-ray because you broke your toe, because you yeah. have whatever reason you do. And I'll notice arteries. You should not see arteries. Uh, but when, because bone, in an x-ray, all you see is calcium. Uh, oh, I see. And your bones are full of calcium, so you see bones. But you should not see any calcification elsewhere. So if you okay see, in a foot X-ray, if you see calcification in the foot arteries, correct, that, means that might indicate it in the heart also. Okay, an artery, I see what you're saying. An artery is an artery. Right? Yeah. Okay. I'll summarize it. So um, the the question was he had a um, a broken he had a foot X-ray right? uh, for a broken toe. Uh, broken toe was fractured. Right. So it was it was fractured, and the doctor took an X-ray and saw some calcification and told him he didn't uh, want to do any, because you could possibly do surgery to fix that foot. You could do a lot of other things, but you don't want to touch that foot with a 10 foot pole if there's a lot of calcification because uh, the, the circulation is not that great, in which case you have to try to heal it non-surgically um, uh, because you don't want to put the patient at risk. He also has, uh, the chiropractor took x-rays of his uh, back and there were calcifications there and there's calcifications mm -hmm. in his neck. So the, the chiropractor doesn't want to do any manipulations for fear that the, the plaque could break off. So it's sometimes you, you just, you know, it's like anything, you, you, you see something, it's like, what's that? And then you find out it's a skin cancer. 
Uh, you sometimes get these things by accident. Uh, and that's why I mention it to them because you could uh, be fine. And then, uh, I mean, think about it. I mean, people go, I don't know, I was doing fine that I had a stroke. So what happened? Uh, they weren't fine. They felt fine, but they weren't fine. And so if I see something that's potentially scary, I like to mention it. Okay, so um, these this shoe is different than this shoe because obviously you don't have that part that goes between the toe because that bothers the heck out of me. But if you have bad circulation, for example, that little thingy that goes between the toes can be um, annoying. Uh, so this kind of a shoe might be a different option for people. Uh, I don't know if you can, if I'm lining this thing up right, but okay. Um, but so this is an option versus uh, this guy. Um, so on this one, this is also, uh, these types of shoes can have uh, a relatively um, decent arch support in here. So this might be uh, a shoe that uh, might help a little bit if you need some arch support as like a house shoe. Wouldn't necessarily recommend this for walking and exercising, but for a home, this might be a good shoe. Uh, Birkenstock type shoes, um, it's kind of a love-hate relationship with those. Either you love them or you hate them. Um, it just depends on how they fit you. So this one, um, how old is this shoe? Five years. Okay. So obviously it held up pretty damn good. Um, you got a little bit of wear over here, which is, which is normal. Uh, it's hard to see, but there's a little bit of wear up and through here, which is again, where all the pressure is on the ball of the foot. Where's your other one? Right. Uh, because, um, if you look at both of these, they're, you may not be able to see them on the screen, but trust me, they're like two peas in a pod, uh, which means that that's fine. I mean, the foot is symmetrical. Sometimes one leg is a little bit longer than the other. And so you get a little bit of a right to left difference. But as long as things are even and there's no, you know, crazy pain, is this problem? Pretty soft. Supplements inside the shoe. So the question for those of you online is that if you are asymmetrical, where one shoe looks different than the other, do you really have to do anything about it? And that's kind of a yes, no answer. Um, if you're not complaining of any problem, it's probably okay. Um, there sometimes are surgeries, knee replacements, hip replacements. The, um, the, uh, the leg ends up a little bit shorter or a little bit longer. And so it's a dramatic change. And so, yes, we can try to shim up one side to balance you out. You do not have to be perfectly symmetrical. Most people are a little bit off. If you've been born that way, then that's the way you are and your body's adapted to it over, over the years. So there may not be anything to do. Um, injuries obviously can change that. Surgeries can change that. Um, scoliosis, sometimes people are kind of bent a little bit and we can try to straighten them out. But the goal is not necessarily to, to shove everybody perfectly normal if you... If you do that too rapidly, you can jam the back. So sometimes we'll do a little bit of an adjustment, a little bit of an adjustment until we get uh, where the patient is happy. And sometimes you go, oh, no, that's too much. Okay, then we dial it back. Is it perfect? No. But is it comfortable? Yeah, I can walk better. I'll live with that. These are some shoes that you might recognize. Oh, I hate these shoes. I like those red ones better that I showed you. <laughs> these, are, these are comfortable shoes. These stink. My kids would never have made it through college with this one. Um, all right. So this is, a uh, who made you this little guy? I did. All right. Perfect. I told you it was an awesome device. So um, so this is a cushy insole. But what's important is what's on the backside, because there's obviously, a uh, we try to offload this area. Who had the question about the fifth? Oh, the guy was on the phone, oh, on the line there. But there was a, a pain under the baby toe side. Well, this is something that we could kind of do. Uh, how long ago did I do this? Oh, wow. Okay, so so one of the things this to, is this will bottom out over time. This white one is more durable. This pink one is not more durable. So sometimes I'll do this as a test. Do you like this? Oh my God, that was great. Oh, I hated it. So this way you can peel this on and off. Uh, and if you like it, then I do the white stuff or I build it up a little bit. Um, um, if you don't like it, you peel it off and we go to plan B. There's also one on the heel here that I put. Uh, and sometimes that can take uh, like an insole that's like this and we can tip it. Uh, and that can give you support, less support. And we can kind of try to balance the foot that way. 
So now we have a, so now we have a difference here. Um, I got back problems. You got back problems. All right. So um, uh, so if, if you notice the um, oh wow, this is you know black. This is the the, the tread that's on the shoe. So on this side wore through the black part. Now you're starting to get to the to the the under layer, so to speak, which is this this white stuff. But if you notice this side versus this side, mm -hmm. uh, there's a difference. And so the question is, why is there a difference? And so it could be um, one foot is is kind of banked differently. Uh, could be a limb length problem. You're putting more pressure on this side, so it hits the ground harder. Hit it harder, it it wears out faster. Um, the problem with Skechers is sometimes the the uh, outer sole material is too soft and it wears out too fast. Uh, but you can also see the wear up on this side here, where you don't necessarily see it on this side here. So on this foot, we would try to balance it out a little bit to kind of make this shoe look like this shoe. Uh, this is three months old. I didn't think they were bad, so I took them off and looked at them. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> after, Thanksgiving. Um, uh, so yeah, so in three months, I mean, now, if, you know, a lot of runners, joggers, marathoners, three months is an old shoe. Uh, for most of us, three months is not even out of the box yet. I do 10,000 steps every day. Though. Yeah. So, well, that's good. That's good. So we just got to figure out a way to balance this out for you a little bit. And that's um, usually going to be, uh, um, if you have a back problem, we got to figure out what, you know, how that's mm -hmm. affecting things. Uh, there could be a foot component to it. Um, and... That's this has been my life with shoes since a child. Okay, so so this is a, a semi custom insole. Sometimes they used to have you step on a scanner, sometimes they make a mold. Yeah. Um, and so this is a, a more of a customized insole, but obviously uh, a former colleague of mine put this extra pad right here to try to offload another pressure source. So these guys, the insole itself usually lasts about two to three years. But again, when do you change your glasses? When you can't see, you know, I can't see anymore. It's too fuzzy. So you go to the doc, you say, yeah, you need a stronger lens. So if this is still doing what it's doing and you're happy with it, this is last year, as long as you're happy with it, this pad will bottom out. Right, no, so that's already bottomed out. yeah, so what we need to do is just replace that pad with either that or um, what I like to do is to put it on the bottom I'm kind of exaggerating it, but he has a pad like this and I sort of put it like that. And so, because what happens, you can sort of see here, it's already kind of feeling, every time you shove your foot in there, you kind of knock it off. If you put it on the bottom, you tend not to do that. And so it can be, uh, stay uh, longer. It, it'll stay longer on there. Uh, we just got to line it up to make sure, you know, it's in the right place. That's the shoe? Yeah. So um, this is, this is kind of the classic wear pattern. Um, Help us see where. Kind of like right across. You know, trying yeah. to see. It kind of goes in this direction right here. So that's the classic wear pattern. Uh, you don't, and then there's some right about here. Again, it's kind of hard to see, but it, again, if we're looking at kind of like a, maybe like a J or a C shape. That's the way it's supposed to go. Oh. And something like this, where did, where did the other go? So something like this might balance uh, <clears throat> guy with a bad back. Something like this might balance you out on that side. I would need to see you, and I'm sure I would walk and be much more comfortable if I had you. I'm sure I need some kind of custom soles for either side. Yeah. And then we could, you know, especially, uh, do you have an insole in that? Oh, no, you have the uh, uh, factory insole. Yeah, well, the sketchers don't come out. No. Because it's a memory foam. And so you don't get that forensic part to it. Uh, because if you if you had like a, a stand like his insole or these other insoles, uh, you can see those dark areas. Uh, this is where the guy's putting pressure. How do we fix that? Right. And then we just got that's that, that's where the uh, it's called biomechanics. We sure. call it biomagic because it's all magic as to how you figure it out. Um, well, everybody, we are getting close to our our shutdown time at at twelve. But thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Susan Myers, I got my baseball. Is that your name? Uh, uh, I do many things with many heart and many heart, so I'm just leaving. And you've been here for, since? I've been here since um, 07. 
There you go. Hello. Hi, Sally. This is Steve Malizia. I've just uh, been seven years with Oakland's Chapter 188, and it's nice to be back in Kaiser after membership. this long hiatus. Mem and he's membership. Chair. Membership. Hi, I'm John Stansbury, and I think I've been a member here for like five years. I have congestive heart failure, and I'm a Kaiser patient. Hi, I'm Gigi McQueen. I've been a member since um, almost less than a almost close to a year. I joined last year in 2022 and I had open heart surgery in 2019 and I'm a Kaiser patient. Hi, I'm Mary Spain and I've been a member since almost a year, not yeah. quite. Well, and I'm enjoying this group very much. Yeah. Great. And what uh, what heart condition did you um, I have a heart failure. Uh, something to do with the mitral valve. I'm Laura Kinley, and uh, I've been with Mended Heart since uh, 2016, and I have uh, uh, a heart stent. Hey, I'm Neil. I think I'm almost at my two years. Had a heart attack in uh, August a couple years ago in London, and have a couple of stents taking care of business right now. And I'm part of the chapter on the board right now, helping with a lot of different tech and program things. I'm Sally Dowell, and um, I've been a member since 2019 when I had um, mitral valve repair surgery, and a cardiologist told me about the group. And I've helped out a little bit with uh, with the um, on the program committee, and right now I'm uh, kind of starting in as uh, probably the uh, the uh, secretary for the group. Oh, I've been a member of the group since way back when. <laughs> Pick some of the conditions you have to tell us about. Oh, the conditions? Mm -hmm. Heart failure, mm -hmm. osteoarthritis, um, osteoporosis. Uh, what else? It just keeps going. <laughs> that's, that's a good start. Thank you. <laughs> Again, I'm John. Uh, one of the big things that Mended Hearts does is uh, visit people who are in the hospital with a heart condition and tell them about Mended Hearts, that there's a possibility of uh, being in a peer support group and pass out a brochure. We can do that at Sutter Hospital, but Kaiser has not allowed it. And what I want is people who have Kaiser to sign a letter with me requesting the cardiology department to allow visiting in Kaiser. So if you have Kaiser and you'd be willing to sign a letter, uh, please let me know. If there's anybody online, uh, I would like to, if you identify yourself, I'll get in touch with you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. What a great idea. They, uh, we used to be at Kaiser. So maybe we can come back. Hi, I'm I'm Sherry, and I've Hi. been with Mended Hearts since 2007. Oh. When, I had, when I had my first valve, my aorta valve replaced, and then I had the tablet re procedure done in January. But why I really came up here is I've been seeing Dr. Pochio for two year, over two years for wound care, and I highly recommend him. He has lots of patients. He's put up with me. me for a long time. And if you like <laughs> this card, they're back on the table. All right. All right. Thank you. What a good endorsement. That's uh, Sherry is one of our, our leaders. Everyone, I think that is um, the end of our time. So uh, thank you so much, everyone who's there, um, for coming and being here with us, as well as those who came and uh, February, we'll see you here, both online and in, in Kaiser's lower level conference room B, 3600 Broadway. Oh. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.